Hi everyone, welcome to our exclusive interview with Caitlin Dunn. She works at My Racehorse. If you're a My Racehorse fan, you know her. You see her everywhere. It's astonishing. I had the pleasure to meet her at the Breeders' Cup, but she honestly became quickly one of my favorite people I've ever got to meet in racing. She's just knowledgeable, smart, young, funny, and we couldn't have had a better guest on our show today. So Caitlin, thank you so much for coming today. Yeah, of course. I'm so excited to be here. The Breeders' Cup, you were all over the place. I've never seen that. It was like Scooby-Doo in one door and then out this door and down the hall. It was it was amazing. And um, so we want to talk all things Breeders' Cup, but we think we should get to know you first because some people, this might be their first introduction getting to know you at Big Play. So why don't we start with what got you into horse racing? Oh, that's kind of a tough question. Um, so I, I grew up in the racing industry. My parents sell two-year-olds. It's called pen hooking, which when it's career day and your parents tell you that they're pen hookers, that's always just a little bit weird to kind of tell the class. But um, basically what we do is we buy yearlings and we sell them as two-year-olds. So um, it's very akin to flipping a house. That's kind of how we put it in layman's terms. Um, so grew up on a farm. Um, I swam through college, so I was super into that. I uh, wasn't really setting my sights on working in the industry. And then I graduated in 2019 um, with my undergrad. And after that, I thought I was going to go and work like in the industry somewhere. Wasn't really sure, probably behind the scenes, more business development. And when COVID hit, that kind of just stopped everything. I went back home to Ocala, Florida, and I started working on the farm. So it was my first time being hands-on. And that's when I got bit by the bug. I think everybody in this industry has gotten bit with. Um, so after that, it was kind of cool. I um, was riding the pony for my dad and it was my first time riding my entire life. And um, then I started kind of helping out with my friend, Andy Biancone, who you guys might see on FanDuel. Um, her dad that year, unfortunately, got cancer and they had two horses going to the Derby. The same Derby Authentic was in 2020 <clears throat> year or so. I was riding the pony. She was riding the derby horse. We had no idea what we were doing. It was just like the girl's trip every time the horses had to go somewhere. And that's kind of when I was like, okay, I want to be in this for sure. Wow. Uh, I mean, you are underselling it in some ways, Caitlin, to me. Your dad is quite impressive. As I can see behind you, you have tons of silks. Why don't we talk about some of the great horses that have come through your dad's program? Yeah, for sure. So um, it's a really it's a really fun program. Um, you know, we have about 150 to 200 horses a year. So with numbers like that, you know, a few of them are going to pop off and kind of become some big ones. Um, our goal is always to sell them at auction. And when they don't, you know, make it through or they are in a, you know, they don't meet the reserve price, we end up keeping them and we go ahead and race them. So it's kind of like our little band of misfits. So Two of these guys behind us, Linster, the pink saddle tail here, and then this one, Diamond Oops, um, behind me, they were two that were kind of a part of our band of misfits. They were actually the same age. They were in the same class. We call it like their graduating class. Um, and they both have raced in multiple Breeders' Cups. Linster holds some track records, so that's been kind of cool. He's a stallion now. Diamond Oops is Andy's pony now. He won over a million dollars at track. We're very proud of him. Um, but other horses that we've had are, um, I think my dad's favorite was Shakespeare. He was a really cool horse. We've had Roy H., Stormy Liberal, Bella Fina, Dream Tree, some really cool ones. So um, I guess new new kid on the block, Yao Pon. He's a stallion over at Spendthrift. We sold him. So kind of cool when you see the kids go off to, to big jobs. <laughs> How do you wind up at My Racehorse and what would you say your role is there? That's another, that's another question. Um, question. Um, so we, I was down in Florida finishing up my master's program, uh, 2020 to 2021. Um, and I was working for a pharmaceutical company for a guy named Bob Edwards, who has E5 racing. And I just wanted to see a career outside of racing to make sure racing was really what I wanted to do. And it definitely showed me like, okay, racing is for me. So I started looking up jobs on, you know, indeed and stuff like in the lexington area and i was feeling kind of hopeless i was like oh if i'm not going to be a trainer or a rider or you know someone as an assistant trainer what am i going to do like and i didn't feel really comp confident in any of those positions and um my boyfriend riley uh now my fiance he had told me hey my friend works at my racehorse she works in marketing do you want me to text her and see and i was like oh my racehorse like they're so cool. Like they won the Derby. Like, I don't think, I don't think they'd have a place for me. Like, I just thought they were this giant corporation, you know, that it would be really hard to kind of get in touch with them. And, um, yeah, I reached out to, to his buddy. And next thing you know, I kind of came in as the events manager, which 
I don't think was a real a real thing at the time. And then I kind of came in and, uh, you know, like I said, now I'm a pony party planner. So <laughs> anyone who comes to the track sees you there. It's a very catch all thing because I've seen you when the people rushed to be in the straight no chaser winner circle. I saw you out there controlling the excitement. I've seen you behind the scenes. We're going to get into some stuff you do with Michael's wife, Amber. Um, but what do you consider the most rewarding part of your job? Honestly, the best thing ever, and I say this all the time, and it probably sounds so cheesy. It's like every horse has all of these owners, and it's, you know, Seize the Gray has over 2,500, and it's like 2,500 friends. Everyone, it's really rewarding seeing how much they love the horse. You know, win, lose, or draw. They just really, really love their horse. And I think as someone who just, I would be happy to go sit in a field with horses all day, like seeing that on people's faces, you know, they're just so happy to be a part of it. So especially when you have a winner and you can have everyone in there and they're chanting and cheering, like that's so much fun. I would take that over a three person winner circle any day, you know, that's beautifully put. And I think when you talk about my racehorse and your connection with it, this to me, Caitlin, I mean, would you say it's fair to say it's been a pretty uh, monumental moment in my racehorse as far as this year goes with winning a Preakness and a Breeders' Cup? So I, might be the wrong person to answer this because I actually wasn't on board with my racehorse until after Authentic. So I know Authentic was huge in putting my racehorse on the map, but I feel like this year was just so special because these two horses were owned completely by my racehorse. So it was all of this hard work that our Bloodstock team puts in and placing the horses in the right spots and the patience of the trainers and everybody that's, you know, believed in us and been a part of that journey. I definitely feel like it actualized us as being real real competitors in this game like these are horses that we took chances on they were modestly priced horses really in the grand scheme of you know the whole the whole industry so having seize the gray and straight no chaser do what they did this year it was just so special yeah i think that's well put i really do think that as far as what your program stands for, this Breeders' Cup was really a testament to that, Caitlin. And I, I really feel like with Dan Blacker, somebody that is so talented, deserves good horses, really has this shining moment because you gave him this horse and allowed this horse to develop with him. And we see the success. I've just got to imagine this encapsulating the entire my racehorse like mantra, which is getting people the experience over years and years and reaching the top spot. So with that being said, what was your Breeders' Cup experience? like like what were your thoughts on this year's breeders cup for sure and first off hats off to our bloodstock team joe moran and nick hines who picked straight no chaser and placed him with dan blacker and all of the patience that dan has had with this horse was heavily rewarded um for me so straight no chaser is a west coast horse i work primarily on the east coast um so a little bit different i didn't have a personal connection with the horse obviously you love them all you know they're all a part of the my racehorse family but I think for me, it was so special to see all the California owners that I don't really get to see that much in person be rewarded for, you know, being a part of the journey, you know, all of the support. And then seeing Joe Moran and Nick Hines and Hannah Bloom just absolutely losing it when that horse crossed the finish line and hugging each other and crying. And same thing with Dan and his wife, Christina Blocker and their kids. It was just, it was so, so special. Like I, I really loved, cause I know how it felt when Seize the Gray won big races, like seeing everybody have those moments, like that is what, that's what just keeps the addiction going, you know? <laughs> so. <laughs> well, what was it like to see that horse win? Yeah, it's, it's huge and it was scary. Cause I was like, we've had so many conversations with Breeders' Cup, how is this gonna go? You know, how many people are gonna be there? And we base it all off of who enters our lotteries. So we knew that the, you know, the interest was high. A lot of people were going to be coming out. And even though Straight No Chaser has a more modest ownership group with around 800 owners, that's still 800 people, you know? So if everyone came out, I don't know if Delmar has a big enough winner circle for that. Um, so we were really trying to gauge it. And I know Breeders' Cup was scared of us, you know? So they were kind of like, I don't know how many people are going to come. And it's funny, I actually couldn't see the race from where I was standing. I was standing behind the winner's circle because I was like on the off chance that he wins, I need to be there first to make sure that security like has help and has support. And um, I was standing and I remember I was just like kind of standing to the side and listening to the race call. And all of a sudden I hear, in straight no chaser is making a move on the outside. And I was like, oh my God, it's really happening. Like this is, he is gonna win this thing. So I looked at um, Olivia Hills who works for Breeders' Cup and she does all the horses relations. 
and we're just locking eyes as like we're, neither of us are watching the race and we're just like locked in and he wins and my eyes just blow and she goes get here now and so i remember i ran to the entrance of the winner's circle and i was like okay what are we gonna do what are we gonna do and they were like okay like we just have to be the really organized like we'll do one with the you know horse coming in and then another photo once the horse is left i was like got it and they were like but we have a musical performance in here after so they need to be quick and i'm watching uh dora who is like one of the super high ups at breeders cup and drew fleming who's the um the ceo of breeders cup they're watching the mass of people just start coming to this gate and they're like you can't you can't get them all in i was like yes we can we've done it before trust me they can do it and they were like okay but they like they have to be calm so i remember kind of felt like a like a black friday sale like i went over and i was like if anyone runs into the winner's circle you're not getting your picture taken but i'm so happy for you guys yay and like we were all just like cheering and happy but i was also like please be safe don't push each other so everyone came in and it was amazing we had one big picture with anyone that had like a paddock pass and the trainer's family and jockey's family horse leaves they do the trophy presentation and then we brought everybody else in anybody that was there for straight no chaser that was behind the winner's circle they got in, they got their picture taken, and then they got out, they did the musical performance, and off we went. So it was it was just really cool. Everyone got their moment, and that's the biggest thing. Like it wouldn't have felt like we won if anybody, if everybody couldn't have gone in and done that to me personally. You know what I mean? I just want them all to be able to like have they're the owners. We wouldn't have been able to have that horse if they didn't buy the shares. So they all deserve a spot in the winner circle, even if there's two hundred or three hundred, right? So it was, it was really, really cool. Definitely a little stressful, but cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so, it's interesting to hear you talk about that because I was standing with a woman who her father had Alzheimer's and she was like, I'm just going to take two days to see if sees the gray or straight, no chaser. One of them wins. Even if they don't, this is the best day of my life. Cause I'm getting two days yeah. just to wait to think of myself and to see this woman just sobbing, like this is the best moment I've had in, you know, two years of taking care of my dad. This has like been the bright spot following it. Does that bring you, um, I'm sure you've heard those stories too, Caitlin. Like, oh, yeah. could you speak on that a little bit about what that's like? You see how this affects people, right? It's not just, oh, I own a horse. That's cool. It's, it's more than that. You guys are giving. Totally. I mean, I think when I first started at my racehorse, I really realized the impact because authentic coming off of that COVID year, you know, people that were you know, locked down, they couldn't leave, they had no, you know, connection with other people because of what was happening, you know, they looked to my racehorse as something to look forward to. They, you know, checked their updates or Authentic was going to run and that was really special. And then you hear about people like maybe they had cancer and they couldn't be exposed to other people, but they had their horses and that was kind of their community and they could go in the Facebook groups and talk to each other. Um, it definitely makes it all the more special because you you just remember like all the times that it's really hard and you're trying to figure out how you're going to accommodate everybody and you definitely can't please everyone but you know there's so many people that are just this is what they're looking forward to and it's it's amazing that's why I say it's like 2,500 friends like you really are this community of of people that you know all want the same thing all have a similar goal which is really special and I, I feel like you can't talk about a horse that's impacted people more than sees the gray and we're going to get into it right now because you have a pretty special connection with him. So talk about Seize the Gray when you first saw him. Oh, man. Seize the Gray. He is he is so special to me for so many reasons. Um, he is the coolest dude. But it was really fun, you know, when our team bought him at the sale. I was at that sale. Um, you know, I was still pretty fresh in my racehorse at that time. Um, but I had somehow convinced Michael to send the yearlings to my dad. I was like, my dad will, you know, do the tours. He'll do the updates on camera, all the things. I don't know if my dad knew he was getting volunteered for all of this, but I knew it was just going to be a really cool experience to get to bring people out so people could meet all of these, all these youngsters. And um, I remember he got to the farm and he was there. I think we had six yearlings that year. We had a pretty big group. Um, and he was, <laughs> Cecil Gray was definitely like, the short little pudgy kid of the class and he just kind of he was super calm lazy in I don't know he wasn't a standout for any reason but it's one thing my dad always says it's like the ones that aren't the standout the ones that just do what they're told and kind of go through the program you know if you don't hear about them that's a good thing you know like that's kind of our our motto and I don't know we got to a point where like he wasn't growing like he wasn't getting tall he was just getting wide 
And we were like, oh my God, he's like, he's just going to stay like this little pony. And then all of a sudden he hit this growth spurt and he started kind of putting the, you know, the pieces together mentally and physically. And I remember dad told me, he was like, this is the perfect horse for Wayne. Cause this horse is not like rattled by anything. He's easygoing. He be, he's okay with shipping. Like he's just smart. He has this, you know, kind of way, way about him. Um, but he was definitely the star of the show. Like on the tours, he was everyone's cuddle bug. Like I was like, if anybody wants to ride him, they can, he's easy, you know, not actually, but, um, you know, people were just draped over him and he, he loved it. He's always loved being in the, in the spotlight. So. Well, it's so cool. You mentioned that because right now, I believe if I'm correct, my racehorse is offering an opportunity to go to Waver Tree Farm, right? And meet yeah. some, would you want to mm -hmm. talk about that experience? Because someone could be walking and seeing the next Seize <laughs> yeah. the Grey or the next. Why don't we talk about that? Definitely. You know, um, we've so Seize the Grey was the first year my dad did it. And um, it was kind of a learning process because at the time, like he didn't really understand why people would want to come to the farm. He's like, why? Why would anybody want a tour of this? But when you're in it, I mean, you know, you might not understand how much people want to see that because they're they're not used to it like you are. So it was actually really cool because my dad called me after the first tour that he did, like after he kind of digested it. And he was like, that really made me appreciate my job. He was like, I kind of lost sight of how blessed we are to be in this really unique industry and wake up and do what we love every day and showing everyone how we care for horses and how much they mean to us. It's just, it really is special. And that's kind of what like made my dad fall in love with my racehorse. He'll kill me for making him sound so mushy, but he is. Um, but the tours are amazing. Like we go out, we show you guys how, you know, a, a typical morning for the horses would be. Um, so you'll see them, you know, train. And then we take you through, you know, the barns. You get to see your horses on the end of a shank, like on the end of the lead rope. Um, we have a lot of therapeutic measures like at, um, at my dad's place, Waver Tree. So we have a, a full swimming pool for the horses. We have cold water spas, vibrating uh, plates that take up an entire stall that use are used on like the NASA astronauts. And then we have all of these different, you know, little bits and bobs because we really want to be preventative. We want to help horses feel good like they're an NFL athlete. So for us, that's it's like its own training room, basically, right? Um, so everyone gets to see these things. And I think that if you don't know at, like anything about horses and you go and you see this you're like I wish I lived at Waver Tree like I wish that this was my house you know what I mean so it's definitely a really cool tour and like just so people can kind of see what goes into this like it's not just you wake up they run around an oval and then they go home like there's so much that happens so definitely come out and check it out if you haven't you know I got really excited too because I looked on your guys website and I mean like you guys have had horses that just this year weren't even my racehorse horses running in the Breeders Cup, like Improbable Lux by Improbable, and you guys had Governor Sam who's by Improbable. Yeah. I mean, you everywhere you look, you're you you know, I can imagine on this farm you're gonna see horses who could one day be in these levels. So I, I definitely it's something I even want to do, Caitlin. And you saw Seize the Gray from day one to the Breeders' mm -hmm. Cup. What was your takeaway from the Breeders' Cup experience with Seize the Gray? For me, you know, it was one of those things I think we knew that it was probably going to be his last race because he was going to go to the stud farm after. So for it was very bittersweet, you know, like I have just loved being around this horse. I've, you know, loved every part of seeing how much everyone loves him, all of his owners. Um, I feel very, very lucky that I got to spend so much time with Wayne uh, Lucas just because he's such a legend. And for it was it was almost like closing the book on you know, this entire journey. And that was kind of, it was, it was, it was a little sad for me. Like I, I love him so much and I know he's having, he's gonna have the best time at Gainesway, trust me. But I just, um, just, you know, kind of realizing that that might be the last time, you know, I see Jaime legged up and go out to the track. It was definitely one of those moments you're just like, okay, this is it, you know, but even though, like I said, win, lose or draw, he's just so special. So Tough, but bittersweet, right? I can tell it really was a horse that affected and was one of the changing of your life kind of horses. Yeah, totally. Yeah. He was a cool dude. Still is. <laughs> so. And as, as I guess, final thing to talk about here, the testament to how cool he is, everywhere I go on the track, someone's wearing Seize the Gray gear. I see hats. Oh, yeah. I see shirts. Um, <laughs> and I, I wind up talking to you, and why don't we talk about what you do with Amber 
because I don't think a lot of people understand what goes into those clothing. So can we talk about it for a second? Absolutely. So um, Amber Barron's, uh, Michael Barron's wife, she started the My Race Horse shop for all of our apparel. And it everything is made to order in-house. We have a whole team there. We have all the machines. We order all of the gear blank and when it's made to order. Like, we all touch it before it leaves the office. So it's very personal, you know, to all of us. But after he won the Preakness, Amber's phone, because she has the Shopify app, just was going cha-ching, 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 because people were buying. That's, like, the little sound that it makes. Like, And she was like oh my gosh, like we have so many orders. So after the Preakness, we came home and I'd get in the office every day around 8 a.m. and we would stay until 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and then come in like every Saturday and Sunday to box up orders, print out photos, you know, all of the things and make sure everybody was getting their stuff. So um, I have nothing to do with the shop other than just like helping out when they need it. But they have done such an incredible job with, I mean, they're perfectionists and the gear is amazing and it is it's so funny like we'll be out and about and amber will see somebody wearing like you know sees things she's like oh we made that like that's so cool so it's definitely fun and it's very rewarding to see everybody enjoying their gear and that kind of thing i thought so too and i thought it was cool because you can go to the track and you look around it's like oh you're part of my tribe Mm -hmm. you know (laughs) exactly exactly i mean it's and it's fun like people wear it with such pride which is so amazing you know if they're going to the track like they're wearing their hat like they want I feel like it's almost like the owner, like they all want to know who, you know, who is who. So if you're standing there in a line for a hot dog, you're like, hey, I own that one too. Or, oh, I'm a part of my racehorse, you know. So it's kind of a cool way to, you know, just put out there that, you know, I'm I'm a part of this. And it kind of opens up the door. I feel like so many owners have made so many lifelong friends that through my racehorse, which is the coolest thing ever. You know what I mean? Just knowing that they've built their own little communities or they do their own watch parties or anything like that. It's, it's really, really cool. Well, I guess we can wrap this up by saying, you know, one thing I experienced firsthand was what you're doing is not just getting a piece of a racehorse. You really are changing lives. It's such a wonderful thing you're doing for racing. It's such a wonderful thing you're putting out there for the world to experience. And uh, we can't thank you enough for, you know, the joy you're bringing us at Big Play because we we're excited about our horse and probable luck. So, uh, Caitlin, I just want to thank you for all that you guys do over there. Where can people find this gear if they want to get in on it, by the way? Just go on the My Racehorse website and go to the shop. And what I will say to close it out, because, you know, for everything that we do at My Racehorse, we could not buy the horses if it wasn't for the owners. And I just want to thank all of them because through them, I've gotten to have these amazing experiences and I've met so many cool people. And it, it seriously all goes back to them, like to those owners, because we wouldn't have Seize the Grey if they didn't buy the shares. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's definitely like, it's a lot of work, but it's also so worth it because they're the reason that we're here. You know what I mean? Oh, that's so well put. Well, Caitlin, it's been a pleasure to get to talk to you. And yeah, uh, looking forward to more interviews in the future, hopefully, because you're just a delight. So thank you. Yay, thanks, Ryan. This was amazing.